So welcome back everybody. My name is Andrew and you're watching the Kelly's Country Life. And if this is your first time visiting the channel, thanks so much for stopping by. We do DIY projects all the time. I do want to give a quick shout out to Vivor. That's a company helping sponsor this build. They've donated all the holes that you're seeing here, stainless drawer sets like this, stainless doors. They donated those in and we're going to include the cost of those at the end of this so you can get a general idea of what it may run you to build an outdoor kitchen space like this. But a big thanks to Vivor for sending those out. That really did help us out. Now we can put our money toward the materials and other things to build this. And they provided discounts on all these barbecue door sets, outdoor kitchen sets. Links are down in the description, so check out those discounts that they gave and offered you, the viewer. So while we work today, I'm going to answer some of y'all's popular questions. We've got a hundred and something thousand views, maybe 200,000 views on this series thus far, a uh, thousand or more comments, and I've been seeing two very common questions, so we'll get those answered for you. So before we start laying out our tile edge and those pieces that we just got in, I want to support this countertop right here, or this bar top, with some shelf supports. Sadly, I just realized I'm one short. No big deal. I'll go back to Lowe's and get that later. But we'll go ahead and get these in. I want to get this bar top exactly where it needs to be before we start tiling. Because once thin set has set up and the tile's in place, you can't go flexing or moving this top anymore. And to be honest with you, it's already so sturdy I don't think I'm gonna be able to flex it much now as it is anyways, but let's get these in just to be safe. All right, so not only am I checking for level this direction, I can make very minor changes. Can't flex this much at all. It's actually very rigid, but I'm also checking for this direction. And don't forget, I am slightly out of level this direction right here. I've got a minor tilt this way. So if we do get blowing rain on top of this, which we will, I would much rather it run this direction and go off to the ground than I would it going back in here on my blackstone, the countertop, everywhere else. Now blowing rain is going to get up there, no doubt about that, but we might as well try to convince it to run this direction where we want it to go. So this is where things are going to get, I will say a little controversial, but <laughs> maybe not the proper way of doing things. So y'all may already notice something. We've made some major changes since I last talked with y'all. I repainted this trim edge two more times. I went to a jet black and man, it did not match our last tile at all. I couldn't find a paint that matched it good. And then I went to a matte black, and believe it or not, we've changed our tile countertop. I've returned all the last tile, which was a charcoal color. We weren't 100% happy with it anyways, and they just got this new slate tile in. It's still a 12 by 24, but you can see it's got the ridges and looks just like natural slate. We like this a lot more, and it's a lot darker tile. So long story short, we have new painted trim edge, new tile. We like this tile a lot more. We're gonna be happier with this. So typically whenever you put down this tile trim edge, it has these ridges and holes in it. Let me show you. All of those right there. So what you typically do is put your thin set down and then you press this on it and the thin set just kind of locks all this in. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and put all my tile edge up here and I'm actually gonna screw it in just to barely hold it. And I'll explain why. Okay, so here's my thinking behind this. You can see that before I ever built this, I spent a lot of time thinking about the layout and widths of everything. So I purposely built this bar top a little short to allow me some wiggle room and allow me to put a full piece of tile in here with zero cutting. I've tried to set all this up to where I have to do minimal amount of cuts. I'm not a tile guy. I don't feel like going out and buying a bunch of expensive tile equipment either. Plus, it's just going to make the process more DIY friendly and easier to spend the time up front getting good measurements versus having to cut every single piece of tile or do something odd later on. So because I left this countertop with plenty of wiggle room, what I can do is move this anywhere that I want it. And because I can go ahead and drop my tile down in there, now I can push these pieces up to it. By the way, I don't know if y'all can tell, the nice thing about this Schluter system is it's got a little piece that sticks out this direction and bumps up to the edge of the tile and it leaves a perfect 
like one eight inch grout line. So I'll actually come back in and put grout right in that. So as long as I keep butting this right to the edge of my tile, I'll keep winding up with that perfect open gap. So now what I'll do is tighten this up once I get everything laid out how I want it. Maybe come right here and shoot a pan head screw in, a really thin one, so it doesn't actually lift up and bother my tile spacing. And then I'll slide the tile down and space all this railing out perfectly, attach it down, and then go back and allow the thin set to do the last of locking everything together. Now I also have to take these corners that I painted, put those in, and then cut me a piece of this track or trim tile edge, put it in here, and kind of put everything together before you lock it in place. So I'll be the first to admit this is taking an extremely long time the way I'm doing it. No doubt if I were to throw this up there, put some thin set down, press this in, it'd be quicker. I just don't trust myself to go make cuts and get proper fit quick enough before my thin set's just gonna drop and go bad because I'm a little too particular. And I've been, been working really hard to get all my joints good and taking my time triple measuring and cutting and grinding a little and then come back and touch up painting and it's taking it's taking a while but i think it's gonna look good when it's done but the screwing it in is probably the longer way but i think it's the better way for a newbie like me now all my pieces are set i'm making sure all my tiles are nice and square and just everything's lining up but regardless i still have a little ways to go i'm gonna take a break for a second and answer an extremely popular question that i've been getting on why i did something a certain way so I can't tell you how many times I've got this question over the last few weeks. I put down this cement backer board that's right here underneath this blue waterproof membrane and underneath the cement backer board is plywood. And a lot of people keep asking, couldn't you have skipped the plywood step? Why did you do that? And that extra time, money, everything else. I had way too big of openings and spaces there. If I had to just put that cement board over the tops, I probably for sure would have had a problem. I had to have a plywood backer there because plywood is extremely strong because it's a bunch of laminated sheets. And anytime you laminate wood, it gets very, very strong. Same way in houses all across America that have tile floors and they have crawl space foundations that are not on concrete. Well, guess what? Underneath that tile is most likely a backer board. And then there's plywood or like an Advantech, a tongue and groove OSB, something that's very strong to take the flex and give out of the floor because the cement backer board is not strong enough. So let's do a little experiment to maybe show this and get the point across here. Here's the other very important point. Most mortars and thin sets are not designed to be applied directly to plywood. They don't adhere to it correctly. And then you lay your tile down and you may have issues to where, well, your base never adhered to this. Now you've got major floor issues. There is some thin sets and mortars out there that have a, uh, an additive in it to help it bond to plywood or it's an additive you can add after the fact but it's not very common to go directly to plywood, but it is possible. So a big advantage over using cement board under your tile is one, this stuff's relatively waterproof and rot proof, although this style is, is somewhat porous, but they make all different types of backer board. But for the most part, it's rot resistant. This is also designed to bond correctly to a thin set or to a cement type material, because that's what it is. So you get good adhesion you also get some rot resistance, some water resistance here, and I definitely have it now that I have the waterproofing membrane over this. Also, what's very important 
And another reason to run this is there's a lot of insulation value here, especially for my hot areas. If I had just plywood, well, guess what? Eventually the tile could get hot enough around the blackstone that this could reach its combustion point, which is not a very high temperature, by the way. But whenever I have the cement board on top of that plywood, well, we all know cement itself just isn't gonna burn. That is a good insulation layer right there. Then you gotta think I've got mortar on top of that, that thin set. Then I have tile on top of that. None of that stuff burns. So I'm gonna want with an over inch layer of what is essentially insulation keeping heat away from my plywood. And then I've also got that fire retardant material painted on my plywood too. So in my mind, there was, there was just no question. These two were gonna get combined, the plywood for the strength, the cement board for all the other positives that I just mentioned. But let's look at something. Again, I think a lot of people think this is super strong stuff. As you can see, it's relatively rigid in short form like this. But look at this. This plywood, although it is a little thicker, is a much smaller piece. You would think this would be stronger, right? Well, look right here. I can go ahead and start bowing it just like this. Watch this. All right, I can go ahead. I think I'm gonna save this piece to use later. I can, I can snap this right now. I can push straight through this, snap it right in half. Easy. Now check this out. This is where when you laminate layers of wood together, basically have fibers going different directions, you get a very strong structure. Look at this. Let's take it a step further. Let's put my entire 150 pound, okay, I'm lying, over 200 pounds on here. There, I don't even think there's any flex in this plywood at all. Major strength. So when you combine these two, now you've taken something that's relatively flexible and will give, which is not good for tile, but has so many other positive properties for tile, and you've just made it very, very strong. All right, so here is the second most popular question. As y'all can see, running out of the wall right here is galvanized piping. This is what's providing my propane to the porch. So a lot of people have reached out and told me, hey, you're not allowed. It's, it's against code to run galvanized fittings for propane. And I've did a lot of looking online because that caught me a little off guard. And it seems to kind of be an old wives tale. There used to be some truth to it maybe way back in the day when galvanized coatings were a little different. Uh, but that it sounds like decades ago they changed the actual chemical properties and coating pot process of the galvanization uh, that goes on that pipe. Now with that said, it also appears that there are still some states and counties that do not allow galvanized pipe. However, that was not the case here. Don't forget, I hired a multi-million dollar gas company that works two different states, many different counties with certified installers. They're the ones that come out here and ran all my gas piping through the house, including popping out galvanized fittings here, behind the stove, other side of the house, water heater, generator hookup. I paid them to do all that because I didn't want any issues with homeowners insurance and leaks and whatever else. I wanted somebody held responsible for gas hookups all inside my home. Just made sense to me. And I had to have an initial installation inspection with a pressure test by the building department. I passed with flying colors. Nothing was mentioned about galvanized fittings. Then I had to come out and get a final inspection after everything was hooked up again from the building department, the people that honor the codes. No issues whatsoever with galvanized hookups. And I really don't think this big of a gas company would have ran something that's against code and gonna get them in trouble. They literally get inspections in counties all over this northern part of the state and southern part of the next state. So those fittings wouldn't even be on their truck. All right, so I spent the afternoon yesterday with uh, my wife and we laid out a bunch of pieces here and kind of did some basic looking around. I highly recommend doing the step of laying out ahead of time so you can see where your cuts are, do you wanna move things around? And I found a couple of damaged pieces of tile, so now's the time for me to remove those, get them off to the side before I get in the heat of the moment. I'm putting thin set down, you slap that tile down and then everything's dried and you go to grout and you realize, oh, this one had a busted edge or something else I just didn't see. So spend the time doing layout. So for example, this area right here, I wound up putting a big tile all the way over here and was left with a strip that I'd have to cut over there, or I can move all the tiles to the center and do a strip on either side, and I think visually that's just gonna look a whole lot better. 
Well, as y'all can see behind me, even though it's early in the morning, the thunderstorms are starting. So I'm only gonna mix up about a half a bag of thin set at a time or even less because they're calling for severe thunderstorms today and I don't have a clue if my job's gonna be stopped or not. So whenever you mix up your thin set, I got ones that's for large format tile, being that this is a large tile, just mix it up to their recommendations on the back. All right, so here we go and wish me luck. Because I've already did a layout yesterday, I know I need to start one tile here and work back and I wanna put my seam down there uh, because it just really looks good to die for another tile to come this direction and meet. I'm avoiding all the 45 degree cuts and craziness since this is my first real big tile job. And again, not a professional. Everything I could find online says use a half inch notch trowel for tiles this size. That's what we're gonna try. Hopefully that doesn't leave too much thin set there that I'm up above these rails. We're gonna see. I may have to adjust accordingly, but for a tile this size, that's the size it's recommended in order to collapse it down correctly and get good coverage on the tile itself. And yes, I really need some sort of good scoop here. All right, so I'm just gonna gently put that in for now until I get my tiles going to either direction and then I'll slowly work this in place. I can feel that it's already done collapsed my trowel lines and then I'll gently line everything up. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw a little more up here and get our second tile in place. So I'm also using eighth of an inch tile spacers here for this particular application. We wanted a small grout line and that looked like that was about as small as we could get away with for this size tile. All right, so should be able to do some minor adjustments right here and then move along. Also keeping me a bucket down here with a sponge to clean up any of this extra thin set. So I realized I just lost about 20 minutes of footage because my microphone somehow turned itself on mute. So I'm gonna show what I was just talking about. So I just, you see me just snap a piece of this to the size that I want, and now we have these outlet boxes in the way. So I'm gonna lay this piece here, make sure I space out for my tile spacer right here, which is an eighth of an inch, come up to my box and make a little pencil mark. I then put a tile spacer down because I'm gonna space this up an eighth of an inch. 
take a mark to the bottom side of the box or take a measurement and then transfer that measurement to the piece of tile right here where I just made the lines for that box. Now I'm gonna come over here. I always purchase an extra box as a template, put that down on those three marks that I just made and then I can draw this out, which I've already done because now I'm showing everything again. So how, have I, how am I gonna cut out a space just like that? That's where one of these wheels come in. I picked this up at Lowe's right in the tile section where all the tile cutters and everything else are. It was $10 for this wheel and it's designed specifically for cutting tile. I think they call it a diamond tipped wheel or something like that. Not exactly sure. Now I will admit whenever you cut tile out with it, it does tend to chip your tile. This is good for rough cutting. It's not gonna leave you a nice clean line where you're gonna butt two pieces of tile together and do a grout line. This does not do good at all for that. You want a snap cutter or one of those wet tile cutter machines, something like that that's gonna leave you a nice clean edge. But this is very good for rough cutting and it's very cheap. So now I'm gonna cut through on the back side. By the way, I've noticed with this, if you cut the front side, you get a cleaner cut. It doesn't chip this black surface as bad as whenever you cut from the back and bust through. But in my particular case, that isn't gonna matter because I am using weatherproof outdoor covers to go over the front side of this tile once I cut that opening. And these are also gasketed and sealed with a foam seal that goes on the back side. Now, technically you should make these up to a metal box, but this is actually gonna seal perfectly fine to my tile to keep water and all out. And it'll just pull to the receptacle that I'm out on the inside. So a little bit of a rough cut of an opening isn't a problem because I'm cutting out the sides of this box. And if you look, well, this, sticks way out beyond the box. So I get a little wiggle room on a rough cut on a larger size opening and I can still cover it up and make it look good with this cover right here. I do suggest that you always wear a respirator when cutting tile or any kind of concrete board. Stuff is not good to breathe. And by the way, you can use that same blade that I just showed you right there to cut your concrete tile board. That stuff that I put down before I laid the tile itself. So one other thing worth mentioning, yesterday I tried putting thin set on the wall over here and uh, troweling it out, just not gonna work. It's gonna make a mess, fall down on your countertop. Probably should have put the wall before the countertop, but I did it this way for a very specific reason. I spaced this countertop out to where I could put full pieces of this 24 inch tile down with zero cutting. It really made my process of installing this better yesterday because I laid everything I had out ahead of time and space this out as far as I could off the countertop. Plus it allowed me to rip four by eight sheets of plywood in half to help save money. No point in going bigger than 24 inches deep. Hopefully all that makes sense. So I knew that I had to put the countertop down first before I went and put my backsplash on. So long story short, that means I have to put backsplash on last. And to do that, it makes a heck of a mess if you try to put your thin set up there first. So I'm gonna do what I guess is called back buttering, I think is a technique I've heard in the past where I'm just gonna put my thin set straight on this tile, trowel it out on that, and then press it to the back. So you can see this technique works out pretty well. I just gotta do a little, a little bit of odd troweling around where these openings are. All right, so now I'll get this pressed into place. So while we're on the subjects of countertops, I'm gonna answer a couple more very common questions that I have. A lot of people have asked, have I seen stone coat countertops? They have a lot of very popular YouTube videos. And basically that shows pour in place epoxy coated countertops. A lot of times you'll see them pour over an MDF material. I haven't really seen plywood. Maybe they pour over that, but it's just thin liquid epoxy. You can put swirls in it, colors, design it however you want it to look. And uh, it's a good looking pour in place type of countertop. My other concern is that's an extremely thin layer of liquid epoxy that you're pouring and then designing it to look how you want. So think about that. We've got outside environment, hot, cold, freezing, and most importantly, 
heat sources out here. You've got a Blackstone pouring heat off of it, cooktop over here, splashes, everything else. I do not trust a very thin layer of epoxy to hold up at all out here with all this heat that's going on. So that just wasn't an option for me at all. The other very common question I keep getting is, why don't you do concrete countertops? And there's two ways to do those. You can do pour in place, or you can build them offsite and bring them in. So for one, I have very limited experience with concrete that made me feel a little uncomfortable about pursuing that. Uh, two, pour in place offsite and bring up here. These are, these are actually huge countertops when you get to looking at it. It'd require quite a few uh, people to come help pull that off. And as you can see, typically I'm working alone. So it wasn't as DIY friendly in my mind. And the biggest reason why is stains. Now, some of y'all may have really good luck with concrete countertops, but whenever I started this series and asked people a while back, hey, what's your thoughts on different types of countertops? I actually had a lot of people private message me, email me, send in pictures of their outdoor kitchens uh, with concrete countertops. And a lot of people talked me out of it because they showed big blotchy oil stains, grease stains, everything else. Uh, several people said they would never do concrete countertops again. Now, I know you can seal concrete, but concrete's quite porous. Even with sealants, eventually they wear off. I would still be concerned about frying grease up here, sauces popping out, a black stone constantly popping grease everywhere, putting bacon and everything else on it. And the last thing I wanted was my brand new countertops having oil stains everywhere and it looked like a shop floor. So that quickly talked me out of doing concrete. Not saying it's not a good surface for outside. It's really strong, durable stuff. I was highly concerned about the stains. So it's been a full 48 hours since I've laid this tile. I wanted to go ahead and rush it and get to grouting so I could get this video out. But at the same time, I want to do the right thing. And I've seen that a lot of stuff online recommended to wait a minimum of 24 hours for all your mortar or thin set to cure underneath before filling in the grout lines. And a lot of websites suggested waiting 48 or more hours. So I decided that's the right thing. Just waited an extra day. Now I know everything should be dried and cured before I seal these joints up. So I just pulled all my tile spacers. Now I'm going around with a little putty knife and anywhere I'm seeing that there is a little bit of mortar sticking out through my seams and gaps. I'm just kind of working this down, popping some of that stuff loose, getting it out of there. And then I'm gonna blow all this down and clean it because I want a good clean joint before I put my grout in it. So I've got my grout mixed up over here in this bucket and I mixed it to what's kind of like a smooth peanut butter consistency. And I'm using the Maypie, that's at least how I pronounce it, the Ultra Color Plus Max. This is their top of the line one, at least that they had at the store that I had. And uh, this is considered their superior one, but what I like about it is it has a fine aggregate in it for some of these super tight grout lines. This one claims that it'll actually work in those joints well. I've got an old rubber float here that I'm going to use to actually work this down into these joints. Ultimately, what you're trying to do here is full pack these joints. So keep working it, working it down in. You do it about a 45 degree angle, come across. Again, no professional here, but you're trying to pack that joint. You don't want to put a light layer there that's just going to crack or crumble on you later. A full pack joint will actually support itself. So I'll actually take some of this out of the bucket just like this. Work it in the joint. And anytime I see a pocket or anything that doesn't look good to me, I'll go back and work it in a little tighter. I'm just kind of mashing it down in and then coming across. Let's see if that gets that joint packed good. All right, so now I'm gonna keep me a big bucket with a sponge over here. As soon as I get done with a section about this size, I'm gonna clean it off. And seeing how much this is staining my water, probably gonna dump this water out every so often too. So I'm not trying to wipe my grout out of the joints here trying to clean up all the excess on the tiles. Well, much as I can get. We'll let this dry for a few hours, then I'll come out here with a clean sponge again to get any last haze off the top of the tiles. 
All right, I'm gonna go change this water out. Keep packing this grout in. And I found that for these back joints right there, I was able to go ahead and mush it in with the trowel, but running my finger along it got me a much smoother joint back there. Uh, as far as all these flat joints go, the old rubber float works the best. Well, several hours later, I am down to the last piece that I just got grouted in. And I've definitely, uh, I've learned a lot along the way. So one tip that I can give you, whenever you just get done grouting, I've been grouting six or eight feet, um, probably six or eight pieces, get all the way around them, then I'll stop. And you can see this is already quickly drying, especially with the fans and stuff going. I found, don't panic. The most important thing is make sure that you get those joints really filled in. And I notice sometimes they pop back up, which lets me know I have an air pocket down there. So I'll spend more time mushing the grout in and then coming across diagonally and at a 45, working in from a couple different directions. Make sure I really get that joint packed. Don't worry about this stuff drying up a little on you. As long as you don't work too far, it doesn't dry completely. And I also noticed that the grout does dry a little quicker in the bucket than I was expecting. You've got about a good, at least with this style grout, 45 minutes of work time. So I made the mistake of mixing one full bag to begin with and I had to throw about half away because it turned rock hard on me. So I've just been mixing uh, probably a third of a bag at a time and that's given me plenty of work time. And if I notice it even remotely start stiffening up, I'll go out there and clean my bucket out, take a break and come back and start again. But once this stuff starts hazing over and drying like this, don't worry about that. Take you a moderately damp sponge. See how wet it is right there. I'm gently going over. I'm not pressing down hard at all because I don't want to pull the grout out of that joint. I've seen that happen. But if you'll go ahead, flip your sponge over and just dampen up all that that's drying on you. Go ahead and rinse it. That little bit of dampening right there releases it. Now it's coming right up. And I'm being very gentle here, because again, I don't want to pull the grout out of the seam. But one thing I have noticed, don't worry about how good your grout looks whenever you're putting it on um, with your rubber float right there. The sponge is the key. Lightly damp, gently go over it, and you can watch it. You can, uh, especially if you go in circles over your grout seam, you're putting some in this way, putting some in the other way, and it takes an ugly grout joint and polishes it right up. Um, the sponge is the key. It really makes me kind of look like I know what the heck I'm doing. So I'll go right over it, get all the big chunks off, and then I'll start with a little more pressure cutting circles over every joint, and they just polish up perfect. All right, so it's been another 24 hours since I put down the grout. A lot of dry time when it comes to doing tile and grout. I mean, you, I was going to go ahead and factor in several days of dry time for the thin set itself and the grout. And then if you're going to apply sealers like I am, which I highly recommend, uh, you just got even more time. So I'm going to use the same sealer that I used on my shower. I didn't see any odd effects from it. I uh, bought an entire gallon of it from Lowe's. It's by the Miracle brand. It's just called Tile uh, Grout and what else is it? stone sealer that's right it's kind of made for everything most important thing you can do you then went through all this time effort and trouble here putting all this stuff in do a test area so i've already taken a foam applicator brush i tested an inconspicuous spot in the very back corner that if this left an odd haze or something just something happened with the coloration on my tile you wouldn't really see it in that corner i've let it dry i buffed it off with a clean rag I can tell zero differences other than the grout in that area is now dark because, well, it's damp. It soaked up this sealer. So if you're not familiar with it, what this sealer does, it's mainly for grout itself. Porcelain and ceramic tiles are relatively resistant to stains and uh, water. So this is porcelain, by the way. It's uh, kind of considered an upgrade to your ceramic tile. It's a little denser. It's kind of known supposedly to be a little more uh, resistant to stains and water penetration especially. But it doesn't hurt to go ahead and seal it. But at the very least, seal your grout lines. Those are what's, I mean, that's just kind of a sanded material. It's very porous. If there's something that's gonna soak up water or out here in our environment, oils, stains, greases, sauces, things like that, I really wanna get this grout sealed up to where it doesn't leak and doesn't absorb stains. That's where this grout sealer really comes in. Now I have found a foam applicator brush works awesome for getting in the little cracks. And what a lot of people will do, say a grout line like this, for example, they'll just work right down the grout line 
You wanna make sure you get plenty there that the grout can actually soak it up and then wait about three to five minutes, buff up the residue. I'm actually gonna soak a damp sponge and go over everything, sealing the tile itself and the grout line, and then come back and wipe that off in three to five minutes. Porcelain doesn't really need to be sealed, but I didn't see any odd effects, no coloration issues. I also run this sealer right over that as well. It's just gonna make it that much more resistant to stains. Alright, so now I'll just come back and wipe up the last of this and anything that's puddled up. Make sure I get my metal edge wiped off as well. Make sure there's a little bit of grout. Check that out. There's still grout on my metal edge right there. Alright, well here is your look. Really happy with the way all this turned out right here, this trim edge. So at first I was upset that uh, we didn't get the stainless look that we wanted, but now looking at it, I'm very happy with the black. We found the perfect paint color to match. This is actually Rust-Oleum Matte Black Hammered. We went through several different types of paint before we found this. And this is a 12 by 24 porcelain slate look tile that we got from Lowe's. I just got these in stock. Really happy with how this area turned out. Now, I, I didn't get super picky with my seams on the back wall and stuff in this area because, well, Blackstone's going here. You're just not going to see it. I had a couple pieces left that fit it and only had to trim one, so that's what I went with. So you can see all the other seams I tried to stagger, center joints. Some areas eh, got away from me. It is what it is. Okay, so this was another good lazy afternoon project. See, I'm out here in my flip-flops, kick back, trying to cool off in this heat. So uh, knocking out the grout and sealing up everything was a good way to kind of stop at this point. So I'll let this dry overnight. I am going to double or triple seal all the grout, especially in this area and the cooktop, just because I know there's gonna be spills, there's gonna be stains, food, everything else. So as quick and easy as it is to seal this stuff, I'm gonna go ahead and, and at least double seal, maybe triple seal, why not, right? Catch y'all in the next video. Thank y'all so much for the support, for sharing, and making this little series a success.